All right. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us today for investing using self-directed IRAs with our guest presenter, Dyke Spotiford. Dykes is a full-time real estate investor based out of the Atlanta area. Uh, he has had many years of experience in real estate investing, specifically centric to utilizing qualified plans, such as IRAs and old 401ks to get these kind of things accomplished. Uh, he is certainly very well known and obviously by the people here is a great wealth of knowledge for anyone interested in learning more about this topic. Uh, between the two of us, if you do have any questions about self-directing an IRA or any type of qualified plan or investment there too, uh, we can most certainly get that answered for you. So do please make sure that you type all of your questions into the chat box and we will address those through the actual presentation. Myself is my name is uh, Ed, excuse me, Alex Perney with Advanta IRA. I'll be your moderator today along with uh, Dykes doing the presenting. I'm a certified IRA services professional here at Advanta and before we do get started, we need to give the applicable disclaimer is that we and our employees do not provide any tax, legal, or investment advice, nor do we endorse any products. Everything that we're going to be presenting here today is for educational purposes only, and we do encourage you to consult with tax and legal professionals before entering into any type of investment arrangement. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar what our role in self-directing an IRA is, such as uh, Biren's question at the very beginning of this, is that we specialize in holding uh, IRAs and different types of qualified plans to make these types of investments happen. So when people talk about a self-directed IRA, we are the custodian and administrator that handles the actual investments for your IRA. We have over 20 plus years of industry experience. Uh, we use multiple banks uh, and make sure that any self-directed IRA cash that you have is covered by FDIC insurance. I do need to update the figures that we do currently manage uh, north of $750 million in assets uh, through our network. And as well, we have dedicated account management for each and every account. So if you're looking to do something like this, we offer dedicated client service at no additional fee to anyone that signs up and uses our service. Uh, one great upcoming event, um, this is a great kind of intro as to uh, the knowledge and different types of investments that Dykes will cover, uh, but another great asset to the education that you can get here is that he will also be offering a class Saturday and Sunday, March 4th and 5th in Atlanta, Georgia. If you'd like some additional information, please go to assets101.com with regards to the hotel that it will be held at if you'd like to get registered. Uh, for the actual course and get uh, hotel rooms and everything. It will be held at a hotel near the airport, so it is very convenient. Um, he will also be presenting with Pete Fortunato, who is a wonderful gentleman. If you would like some, if you would like to get information from him with regards to self-directing, uh, specifically doing lending and options, I've personally taken classes from Pete in the past, uh, and I can't speak enough as to how uh, wonderfully. Uh, good to the information that he presents is and how much of a great resource it can be to actually take a live course with these people because not only do you get the great information that they present but also get to have the great networking opportunities that go along with being in a room full of like-minded investors and other types of people like that. So without me getting uh, too much farther uh, off topic, I would like to hand this over to Dykes, who will be presenting today. Uh, if you do have any questions, please do type them into the chat box. We will uh, address them throughout the presentation, so don't wait till the end uh, so that you don't get your question answered in the allotted time. Type them in. Excuse me. We will get through them uh, throughout the presentation. So with that said, Dykes, take it away. All right. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, and I do want to say this event next week, even though the title here on the screen might say Roth IRA, we'll be talking about regular IRAs, traditional IRAs, as well as Roth IRAs. We just think the Roth IRA is the most potent uh, form of IRA. We'll also be talking about uh, HSAs, Coverdales, and uh, solo 401ks uh, uh, will be part of the class as well. So I uh, would invite any of you to come. I know Avanta is uh, sending a couple of people, so uh, you could talk to Avanta representatives more of that class if you'd like. Without further ado, let's get on into some examples here for our short uh, webinar that we uh, have uh, with time limited. Let's look at some of the things that you might want to invest your um, IRA in, and let's talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages. I always suggest that one of the first 
deals that you should do in your self-directed IRA is a straight loan. And this uh, uh, example will show you uh, how simple that is. And investors found a house that when fixed up would be worth at least 150000 Investors have been able to negotiate an all-cash purchase price of $100,000, but the house needs 5000 and fix up for paint, carpet, uh, might need um, uh, uh, some work on the air conditioner or whatever. The investor wants to flip the house and comes to you to borrow the money. You just happen to have 105000 in your self-directed IRA. Now, don't worry if you don't have that much. We'll show you just a couple of other examples where you don't need that. And the last sentence on this slide, you decide is a good deal, is a very important sentence. You don't want to do deals in your IRA that you wouldn't know how to do outside of your IRA. And you want to know when you look at a good deal and when not. So even though you're making a loan, you want to know that if you had found that uh, opportunity instead of the investor you're loaning to, that you would have done the deal yourself. So you want to make sure it's a good deal. There's a lot of times that bars will come to you uh, with just mediocre or, a lot, or many times bad deals, and you need to recognize those and stay away from them. One of many solutions. You offer to loan the investor the 105000 he needs at 15% with five points. For those of you not familiar with hard money loans, these are typical rates, even though you can get them down to 10 or 12% uh, percent these days with uh, two or three points. A point is 1% of the loan amount. So uh, five, uh, five points on the 105000 would be 5% of the loan amount. Monthly payments of interest only for six months, then the full repayment is due. Procedures and documents. Number one, direct a custodian to send the 105000 from your IRA to the closing attorney. Now, you never send the uh, monies to the investor directly. You always send it through a closing attorney or title company if you use title companies in your state because you want the paperwork signed and you want everything documented and recorded properly. Two, have the attorney prepare a mortgage and note according to the terms that you and the investor have agreed upon. Monthly payments to be $1,312.50 with a balloon at the end of six months in the amount of $106,312. All right? Results. If the loan goes a full six months, there's five, uh, $5,250 in points paid back to your IRA at closing. Over the six months that the loan has uh, been outstanding, there's been payments of interest only of $7,875 for a total of $13,125 earnings on your $105,000 loan. Now, you can plug that into a financial calculator or amortization program, and you find out the yield is 25% annualized. 25% is good. One thing I want you to make sure you understand is you can't eat yield. Yield is only an indicator of how fast uh, money moves, in other words, the velocity of money. The faster money comes back to you, the higher the yield. But that's not actual dollars. In this case, you earn $13,125. That is what you can actually put in the bank, put in your self-directed IRA. Uh, but that, is, uh, that does not indicate that it's any better than another deal that earned $13,125. All right, let's look at a wrap loan example using the same situation. Investors found a house worth at least 150000 as a flip. Uh, they've been, in this case, the investor's been able to negotiate a purchase price of 100000 with seller financing, $10,000 down, and the seller carrying back financing at 10%, interest only, monthly payments with a balloon in six months. The house needs 5000 and fix up for paint, carpet, and so forth. The investor wants to flip the house and comes to you to borrow the money. You happen to have 15000 in your self-directed IRA, and again, you decide it's a good deal. One of many solutions, you offer to loan the investor the 15000 they need, but will wrap the seller's loan at 15% and zero points. Now, why zero points? Because the investor was the one that found the money by negotiating with the seller. So uh, in this case, be careful because uh, usury would be calculated on your equity in the wrap plus the points that were generated as opposed to just your face rate on your note and um, mortgage. So be careful about that. That's, uh, that's a usury issue that you want to avoid. The investor will make monthly payments of interest only for six months and the full repayment is due. All right. 
procedure and documents. Direct the custodian to send the 15000 again, directly to the closing attorney or title company. Have the attorney re- prepare a wrap mortgage and wrap note according to the terms in which you and the investor have agreed. The month of payments, thirteen twelve fifty. Balloon at the end of six months, one hundred and six three twelve fifty. All right. The monthly payments can be handled by either the investor making two checks, which is the way we normally do this for an IRA, one to the seller for $750, one to your IRA for $562. Now note the total of that is that same $1,312.50 that we talked about as uh, 15% uh, on the loan. Both checks are sent to you so that you can check off on your spreadsheet that you that both payments have been received. You forward the seller's check on the, to them, and you forward the uh, IRA check on to your custodian. Another way monthly payments can be handled is an investor makes a single check to your IRA for the full $1,312. Now, this is the way we handle wrap loans outside of the IRA. But inside the IRA, that means that you'll have to then direct the custodian to send the $750 each month to the seller. That's why we normally use the method A, where two checks are written instead of one. Uh, that will require a direction of investment each month to the custodian, and it can certainly delay getting the seller their check. So you want to make sure that uh, the seller gets their check in a timely manner. And, of course, the method C is the third, a third-party servicer can collect and distribute the funds as it comes in. And, again, the final checks can be handled in a like manner uh, to what we just discussed. Let's look at the results. If it goes to full six months, there is $7,875 a month of payments coming in and interest only, but $4,500 has to be paid back to the seller. That leaves $3,375 in earnings on your $15,000. Plugging that into the calculator and amortization program will show that's a 45% rate of return. Problem is $3,300 is kind of getting a little bit on the low side for me, even though the, the rate of return is higher. Let's see if we can do a little bit better. Uh, uh, let's, uh, yeah, go ahead, Alex. Uh, there's two questions since we're kind of between the two examples. Uh, we have two. One is uh, one that I'll take real quick, and then the other one for you. Uh, Elizabeth asks, what's the uh, annual custodian's fees? Uh, if you want to grab my contact information at the end of this, Elizabeth, I'm certainly happy to uh, go through uh, timing, how to get things started, and fees. More than more than happy to do that for you. And then Dykes, Tracy asks, I am in year four of an inherited Roth IRA. I want to ensure I will not be taxed on the inheritance. What do I need to do? If you're in year four of an inherited IRA, you're paying taxes each year on the minimum required distribution. When you inherited that IRA, uh, there was a calculation done as to the value of the IRA on December 31st of the year prior to the year you started taking your distributions, which would have been the year after the uh, person passed away. Then each year, the December 31st uh, valuation will be used to calculate a uh, minimum required distribution, and that distribution is based on your projected lifetime. Uh, You might want to talk to your custodian. They can kind of walk you through how the calculation is done. But if it's a Roth IRA, you won't have any taxes, any income taxes to pay on that. But if it's a traditional IRA, uh, it will just add to your ordinary income. Be no Social Security and Medicare taxes on it, but you will pay ordinary income tax. Yep, that's exactly right. And Tracy, if you do want to delve a little bit deeper into that, I'm happy to uh, to definitely uh, expound on that. If you want to grab my contact information as well, we can certainly uh, help you out with some more um, inherited IRA questions. But thanks for getting those addressed, Dykes. And let's go on to that next uh, example you got. Okay. An investor has found a house. Again, that's worth $150,000. investor has been able to negotiate an all-cash purchase price of $100,000 and needs $5,000 for fix-up. He wants to flip the house, comes to you to borrow the money. But in this case, you only have $2,000 in your self-directed IRA. But, again, you decide it's a good deal. You do know others that have money to lend. You show the deal to a couple and one commits $104,000 at 12% interest only, no points. You then offer to loan the investor the 105 total that he needs at 15% and zero points. Now, in this case, you really should be getting the points, but we'll talk, uh, I'm doing this for a reason, showing zero points to start with. The investor will make monthly payments of interest only for six months, then the full repayment is due. If the loan goes the full six months, there's $7,875 in interest payments coming in over that period of time, 
minus what has to be paid to the other lender, their 12%, which is $6,240, leaving $1,635 in earnings on your $1,000 loan. Now, that's a pretty good rate of return, 327%. But again, the dollars are getting smaller, even though the rate of, the rate of return is getting higher. The dollars is what uh, I look at. Uh, for $1,635, that's almost not worth me going out and looking at and doing my due diligence uh, and putting the whole thing together. So I want a little bit better return than that. Well, what if I did charge five points? After all, I found all the money for the investor. The results is that the loan goes a full six months. There's $5,250 in points paid at closing, $7,800 again in, in interest coming in, and $6,200 paid out, leaving a net of $6,885 on my $1,000 loan. Now, I can live with that. Uh, I can't even calculate the uh, rate of return because notice that when the money came in for the, um, for the loan, uh, $5,250 went back out at, right after the closing to my IRA account. So I have nothing invested in it. As a matter of fact, I've made money on day one of the loan. So... How many times can you do this? Well, the answer is over and over and over as long as you can find these deals and other people that have money to invest because it's not uh, net taking any money out of your account. So notice you turned $1,000 into $6,800 in, in just six months. Not bad. All right, a participating loan example. I threw this one in just to show you that you can use participating loans if you, if you like. Uh, the investor has found a, a house worth 150000 negotiated a purchase price of 100000 needs 5000 to fix up. Wants to, the investor wants to flip the house, and you have the 105000 your self-directed IRA, or you can find somebody that does have the 105000 You decide it's a good deal. You offer to loan the investor the 105 on a participating loan. Then the, when the property is sold, the net profit will be split 50-50. Results, investor purchases, fixes up, and sells the property. At closing, your IRA receives the 105000 loan back plus 50% of the profit, say $16,000. That's a 29% annualized return. Though good in dollars, the return rate is showing a little bit lower than what we were just looking at. But it might be a deal that you want to do because of the participating uh, possibilities in the loan. All right, how about uh, you found a house that needs fixing up and reselling worth $150,000. Now, this is you. This is not somebody coming to you for a loan. Now, you could buy that house in your IRA, but then you could not go out and pick up a hammer and swing it uh, and do anything on fixing up the property because that would be uh, providing services, which is a prohibited transaction. So that could blow up your whole IRA, so you don't want to do that. So here's a way that you might approach it. Uh, let's say you've been able to negotiate the purchase price of $100,000. There's going to be 5000 needed for fix-up, but you only have 2000 in your self-directed IRA. You know others that have money to lend. You show the deal to a couple. One commits $104,000, 12% interest only, no points. No monthly payments for six months, then full repayment. You then get an investor friend of someone that has their own um, workforce to, to fix the house up. Get them to purchase the house in their corporation using your lender's money along with $1,000 from your IRA. This $1,000 will be for an option for your IRA to purchase the house for $110,000. Results. The friend investor finds a third-party buyer who wants to buy the house for $150,000, but your IRA has an option. You agree that your IRA will cancel the option for a return of your option money plus $27,000. Therefore, your IRA invested $1,000 and in six months got a return of $28,000, which is a 5,400% annualized return. Now, I think you might like that a little bit more. Now, why is this not a unrelated business taxable income transaction? Well, number one, the loan that was put on uh, the property by, your, uh, by a, a, a third party, and there is no loan that, uh, that your IRA did not own the property, so the loan on the property did not cause an unrelated business income tax issue. Neither did the flipping of the property because it was not your IRA that owned the property that quick turned it like a business. It was some independent third party. Okay? Your IRA was simply an option holder on the property. 
Great. Uh, Dykes, before we get into that, we got a couple good questions over sure. here. So I uh, just want to knock them out before we get into structures. Uh, a few uh, directed towards us. Uh, Amanda, yes, um, if you did sign up and give us your email, you can certainly get a copy of the slides and we will uh, be recording this as well. So thanks for asking that. Um, Rose, does the IRA, did, IRA custodian determine who the servicer of the loan will be if you use one? Uh, we certainly don't, so long as that they are you know, not a not a related party to you. You can, you know, certainly shop around and find someone that you would like to provide that service to you. Now, uh, Weeping and Elizabeth have two good ones for Dykes to answer. Uh, Weeping asks, if the flipper spends the money on things other than the flipping project and does not pay me back in six months, what can I do? Well, that's why you have a deed of trust or mortgage against the property. I shouldn't say you, but your IRA has a deed of trust or mortgage against the property. And again, you'd send the money only to the closing attorney so you know the money was used uh, for uh, the purchase of the property. Now, the 5000 for the fix-up uh, might be used somewhere else, but first of all, you've decided that it was a good deal, meaning that there is enough room, enough equity in the property above your loan that if you had to foreclose that your IRA would actually uh, make more money than if it had gotten paid back as agreed. Exactly. Uh, Elizabeth, if I take 30 k and have it in my self-directed IRA to purchase a flip property, once sold, what amount of cash do I put back in when the property sells? Do I need to put all the 30 k and the profit back? Okay. First of all, do not flip a property in your IRA. IRAs are for investments, not for running a business, and the IRS considers flipping properties as running a business. Each house is considered an inventory item in that case. Now, if you flip just one house in your IRA, you probably won't have much of a problem with that, even though it could be considered by the IRS uh, business. It's when you start doing two, three, four, and you set a precedent for uh, holding short term and just fixing up and reselling that you could run into this unrelated business income tax issue. Um, the uh, I'm, I just lost my train of thought. Um, Sorry, I, I was I was thinking about something else. Um, sorry, Alex, wh where were we? Oh, yeah, uh, she was asking yeah, about no, the 30000 um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, I think that definitely uh, covers it. And, uh, you know, again, it's just, oh, you know. Yeah, I know what I wanted to say. Um, any t type of uh, property that is owned in the IRA needs to be put into service. The IRS uses that term, put into service, to indicate rent it out. So that shows it's an investment property as opposed to being inventory for a business. So I wanted to make that point. Sure, and then we just got uh, two more questions, and we'll get right into that. Sure. Uh, and they actually would probably be very good questions to ask. Uh, Shelly asked, where is a good place to find a uh, house flippers or people that you'd like to lend money to? The local RIAs are a great place to, to find both novices and more advanced investors. Also, uh, talking to real estate uh, agents, uh, uh, know who's doing a lot of business in the area, and contractors are another good place to, to find um, owners that might be uh, looking for additional money. Wholesale lists, there's always people that are wanting to buy on wholesale lists that need money. As a matter of fact, one of the ways I've made some good money is uh, finding a good wholesaler, somebody that really did buy, uh, did have properties that were under market and offer that uh, that their buyers could buy with my financing. And that helped the wholesaler help me and help the buyers. Fantastic. That's a great one. Uh, Rose asks, uh, the last question before we get in there, uh, how do you find a loan servicer if you want to use one? I, Rose, I don't have a good recommendation for you. I hear there are some out there. Uh, we deal with uh, many, many loans through my office. And with, when it's uh, involved with the IRA, we have the checks made out to the IRA custodian but sent to our post office box. We only have it come through our hands to know when the uh, payment was made and that it was made. And we send, then send the check on with the coupon to the, uh, to the custodian, uh, and they'll put it in the IRA account. So we do our own servicing. We don't uh, go with an outside uh, company. All right, great. Uh, Jose, I do see your question, but uh, when we uh, jump into the next one, let's get into uh, IRA investment structures, and uh, we'll address that question here in a minute, but a great question, Jose. Thank you. All right. 
Okay, let's talk about some structures. First of all, let's look at the normal IRA investment structure where you as the account owner have an IRA with a custodian and you hold certain kinds of investments in there. The kinds we're interested in that, are, that apply to real estate are options, notes and mortgage, which is one of my favorite, and tax certificates. Now, notice I didn't say tax deeds. I said tax certificates. There is a difference. Tax certificate is just a lien on a property where a deed actually has an ownership uh, issue. Now, these type of investments carry very little liability, and so you don't really worry about your IRA being exposed to these types of deals. You might also use an IRA asset holding trust. Uh, this is a grantor or a non-grantor revocable uh, trust. Most of them, I'd say 98% of them, are going to be grantor type trust, uh, which do not require a tax return. One of the important parts is that the trustee be a totally independent third-party, non-disqualified person. So the IRA account holder is not the person that should be a trustee of these trusts. Now, somebody's going to come along and say there's nothing in the tax code that says that the account holder can't be the trustee, and that is true. However, we see all the time people that are trustees of trust or um, of, of their own account or they're the managers of an LLC owned by their IRA, create prohibited transactions just because they're trying to get business done and don't really think about uh, the uh, prohibited transaction rules. So I'd get a totally independent third party. Again, I'd only have deals in there such as options, notes, and mortgages, and tax certificates that carry very little, if any, liability uh, with them uh, as to ownership. Now, if you wanted to, to buy actual real estate inside of the IRA, the only way that I would do that is have an attorney, not you, but have an attorney set up an LLC owned by your IRA. Again, the manager should be a totally independent, third-party, non-disqualified person acting as manager. And that manager should be paid something. It doesn't have to be paid a lot, but paid something for performing services by the LLC. And that payment should come from the LLC, not from you personally and not from your IRA. You need to fund that LLC, and it can then buy uh, free and clear land contracts, tax deeds. It can actually buy leverage property or dealer property if it's willing to pay the unrelated business income tax. Remember, dealer property does not blow up your IRA. It just exposes it to unrelated business income tax. Which, by the way, if if you're not familiar with unrelated business income tax, it hits 39.6% uh, at just $12,500 in profits. That's because it's uh, calculated on trust tax rates. An IRA is considered a trust in itself. Okay. Now, why do I have an LLC here? Because state law, whatever state you're in, mandates a liability shield between the LLC and the IRA, also between the LLC and the manager. So the IRA is uh, protected from exposure to liabilities brought, upon, brought about by the free and clear property or the ownership in the land contracts, because part of a land contract is a deed to property, or tax deeds, or, again, the leveraged property and the dealer property. Okay. Now, let's look at a real-life example here of a deal that I looked at where uh, I was offered a, a property subject to an institutional financing. I also knew of a second property that could be bought subject, uh, or excuse me, with owner financing. And I could have bought both of those properties in my IRA by uh, deeds directly into the IRA uh, that the custodian held. One of the problems with this particular structure is the liability. Another is unrelated business income tax because of the uh, loans that were on both properties. And, of course, someone had to manage the property. And uh, management could be considered a service if it, if it uh, involves too much work. All right. So what, uh, what could I do? I could set up a single-member LLC owned by the IRA, and I, I misspoke as would not be me si uh, setting up the single-member LLC. I would have an attorney set it up uh, for the IRA, and the attorney would be paid by the IRA uh, to form the single-member LLC and register it. 
and then I could have the single member LLC, which was funded by the IRA, purchase the two properties, and uh, I would have the liability exposure solved, but I'd still have the unrelated business income tax and management. Remember, everything just goes through the single member LLC for tax purposes, uh, so I would still have uh, unrelated business income tax involvement here. Now, here's what I actually did. I had another party, a fellow, another uh, investor that had his own work crews and was very experienced with fixing up properties. He also had uh, a management uh, uh, office so that he could manage properties. Had him set up a single member LLC that would be the, uh, and the only assets of the single member LLC would be the two properties, just to segregate it from everything else that he was doing. Then that, that single member LLC bought the two properties, one subject to institutional financing, the other with owner financing, but they had to have some uh, down payment, and that down payment came from my IRA. Now, it came in the form of participating loan, but it could have been a loan with an option, uh, but in this case it was a participating loan. And in order to secure that money, a second mortgage was uh, given back to the IRA by uh, on each one of the properties. And in that case, I solved my liability issue because now my IRA didn't own the properties even indirectly. It solved the unrelated business income tax issue because my, uh, my friend uh, with his uh, single member LLC owned the property set with the subject to financing. And then of course my friend with his uh, management office was able to handle all the management for the property. Okay. All right. All let's right. Uh, do some questions, Alex. Fantastic. Well, uh, Jose, right before we got into the um, the second portion of this, I actually asked a, a very good question. I think a lot of people will like. Before lending, what due diligence do you recommend? Good question. Um, I spend a whole weekend uh, on another class for hard money lending where we do talk about uh, due diligence and actually the paperwork uh, that's involved in doing a good quality hard money loan. Making a loan is not hard. Doing a proper loan is what uh, takes the effort, and your success of a loan is all determined up front. All right, so let's look at a few of the things we'll uh, concern ourselves with. The credit of the bar is not a big deal with a hard money loan. The reason it's called a hard money loan is it uses hard assets as the primary uh, repayment method. So we're going to look at the property. But I do look sometimes, if I don't know the bar very well, I will look at their credit just to see what the credit history is. Are they good payers? Are they likely to have a bankruptcy somewhere uh, during the time that I'm making the loan? Uh, I just generally want to know more about them. Have they had a bankruptcy in the past? But then the primary thing I look at is the property. We will do uh, comparable analysis of uh, other properties that are close by. We ask the bar for his uh, uh, comps. Then we'd pull our own comps, and then we go to the neighborhood. First thing I do is I drive to the house, and I put my eyes on the house, look at it for a couple of minutes, and then I don't even get out of the car. I then drive to the comps. And I say, are these real comps? And most of the time they will be, but then there'll be times you say, nope, that's not a really a comp. That's not comparable to what I'm about to loan on. And I would look at the prices of those comps sold for. Then I go back to the subject property and I go through the property itself. Has the bar calculated uh, properly what the uh, fix-up costs are going to be? Having been a real estate investor now for 37 years, uh, I have a pretty good handle on that. But if I didn't, I'd get somebody to go with me that did have a good handle on it to know if really it was only a $5,000 fix-up or is it a $30,000 fix-up or a $50,000 fix-up. I then, uh, uh, once I get all this information and I determine that the investor has the ability to get the uh, house fixed up, as they were talking about, uh, I go back and I put the paperwork together for the attorney. Now, the attorney can do this paperwork for you. The trouble is, if you let the attorney do it, he's going to use regular Fannie Mae forms. And if anybody's ever looked at the Fannie Mae forms, they're all very uh, bar-oriented. So I want it more lender-oriented. So I do have my own forms that the attorney uses for the note and for the uh, deed of trust. 
And um, that's basically it. We send the money over along with the forms to the attorney. And uh, if there's if there's a lot of fix-up to be done, like a $30,000 fix-up, we'll only give the borrower uh, five to 7000 to start with. And when they fix up that much, uh, do that much work, we have another draw and usually three or four draws to get them all the money for the fix-up. Great. Uh, we have Rose has two questions. Uh, if you, if she asks one, I need a little bit more information on possible IRA investment structure. Uh, Rose, so that I would say look into taking the course next weekend if you have the ability to uh, attend or if you have, would like some more information. Those are great ways to get additional information on different structures, different types of investments, uh, you know, taking something that, you know, Dykes, especially with Pete there as well. Pete is a, a wealth of information on very creative different structures. So uh, I, I would point you to that. Or, you know, we do offer a lot of free education as well. Um, definitely not as in-depth or as specific as what you're going to get uh, from people like Dykes and Pete Fortunato. But there's a lot of stuff out there that is uh, pretty readily available for you to educate yourself on. And right. she also asked, and Dykes, I'm going to give this one to you, uh, do you need a third-party loan servicer? No, you do not need a third-party loan servicer. As I was explaining a little bit earlier, we service our own loans, but the checks are n never written to us. That would create a prohibited transaction if the checks were made out to me personally or my company or one of my other entities, and then we ran it through the bank account and then sent a check on to the IRA custodian. That would be a prohibited transaction. So we tell the bars to write the checks out to the custodian, but instead of sending directly to the custodian, we have those checks sent to our P.O. box so that we can log them in, put them in another envelope, and then send them on along with the coupon to the custodian to be deposited in our IRA account. Exactly. Uh, Elizabeth, I do believe your question about uh, utilizing an LLC was pretty well covered in the uh, last few slides. So if you do have any questions uh, on those, just type them in again. But I think that one was pretty well uh, covered about the ability to use uh, an LLC and how to do that. Um, Janie asked, why does an attorney need to be used to set up the LLC for an IRA? Because if you set up the LLC for the IRA, you're providing services to the LLC. Now, you might say, well, it doesn't take much to set it up. But if it doesn't take much to set it up, why does an attorney charge 450 to $700 to set one up? I think the IRS would, uh, would point to the attorney's fee as an indicator of what the value of those services were. And that would be a prohibited transaction. In that case, blow up your whole IRA, not just the amount that's involved, but the whole IRA back to January 1st of the year in which the uh, prohibited transaction occurred. Great. Uh, Eric has a good question about LLCs and specifics. If I create a multi-member LLC to buy a piece of raw land, then fund that LLC with two self-directed IRAs, a traditional and Roth, can I add more money later to the LLC by making contributions to the two IRA accounts in the proportion each IRA owns of the LLC? Great question. Uh, if you knew the answer, I'd love to hear it because the IRS has not made a firm statement on, on whether you can do that or not. The Swanson case from back in the 90s indicated that initial funding of an entity, in that case a corporation, but it would the same concept would apply to an LLC. The initial funding uh, was not for buying the stock or the interest in the entity, but rather the formation. The entity was not a, um, a uh, non-disqualified party until the funding occurred. Now, you might say, well, what do you mean non-disqualified party, uh, a, a disqualified party? Well, it would become a disqualified party because 50% or more was owned by your IRA. And therefore, the argument uh, in court in the Swanson case was that uh, the entity was not a disqualified party until it was uh, had its initial funding. So that is the initial funding. Now, anything after the initial funding, additional capitalization goes to buy additional interest in the entity, and therefore, by virtue of what the court said, would be a prohibited transaction. So all of us that are conservative and um, you know, and that includes Pete and many custodians say that once you set up an entity in the IRA, you can't put any more funds into it. Now, let's look at the other side of the coin. The other side of the coin in uh, a couple of DOL cases, Pentegra and Verizon, said that uh, it could be funded, a sub-entity could be funded, but that was in the case of a 401k pension plan and not in the case of an IRA, even though the same rules apply to both. 
So I'd be very, very careful in doing any additional funding to an entity, even a trust that was set up by an IRA. Now, Great. while I'm thinking about it, Alex, let's, uh, let's look at the other side of that. What if you wanted to distribute money out of the LLC or trust back to the IRA? That's okay. That's okay. It's just additional funding into the IRA or trust that uh, has the question. Certainly. Uh, and now moving on to uh, Shelley's question, what are your thoughts about putting your money into a deal where there are many investors on a large apartment building and they – guarantee 6% return, but they do all the work. My concern is liquidity. How do I get my initial investment back? Is it better to get a quick turnaround? All right, Shelley. Uh, I think you are right on target with your concerns. Uh, liquidity is a big concern once you get into a structure such as the one you described. Uh, you're pretty much at the mercy of whoever's running the structure, whoever's managing it and uh, you may have a hard time uh, getting your money back, even at the projected uh, wrap-up date. Uh, if the market and the economy is not uh, conducive to doing that, uh, it may get extended on out, and uh, that may tie up your money for later. Now, you also, I also heard the term guaranteed, which tells me that you must have a security involvement there. So you make sure that whoever the promoter is uh, has the correct exemptions from either or the SEC or the state securities department, because even if they have all your best interest at heart and they do what they should do, uh, they can still get shut down by a securities violation. Great. So Keith asked, with the profit from the IRA money, can you walk away with any money in your pocket, or does all of the money have to be put back into the IRA once you get it? Simple answer, yes, all the money has to go back to the IRA. Uh, you can't touch the money whatsoever, any portion of it. Uh, Jeff asks, on a checkbook control IRA, the payment can be made to the LLC and then deposited by myself, right? Well, with a uh, checkbook LLC, we're not, Pete nor I nor many of the other custodians are um, – comfortable with you being your own trustee of a trust or your own manager of the LLC, which typically checkbook uh, IRAs are, are set up with LLCs. Um, even if you are the manager, the checks have to be written out to the LLC and it has to go into the LLC bank account. It can't go into your personal bank account. And having control over the checkbook is a big question mark as to how the IRS would look at that if they ever wanted to come down on you. Uh, great, great answer to that question. Uh, and the last one that we have over here, does the issue exist with both single-member and multi-member LLCs? I have heard both yes and no asked by Eric. Yeah, it does uh, apply to both single-member and multi-member LLCs as far as the checkbook LLC concerns are. Uh, the concern is not so much with the non-manager account holder as with the manager account holder. That's where the real issue comes. That's why you might hear uh, some different uh, uh, opinions about multi-member and single members because you got a manager in the multi-member that is the account holder of only one of the accounts that's involved. Good. And then uh, here's the last one that's asked. Actually, a pretty, pretty in-depth, pretty good question asked by Arthur. I would like to use my IRA to purchase a rental property along with a few other partners. Would we need to hire an independent property manager to avoid UBIT, or would one of my partners be able to manage the property? Also, for any property repairs, is, is it enough that I do not swing a hammer, quote, or would, it, or would our investor group need to avoid any work on the property altogether? Uh, the w property obviously is going to need work at one time or the other, and that is where uh, for sure you need to hire a handyman, an independent third party. Uh, that uh, that party is only paid by the IRA. It's not you. Uh, I, a lot of times use the example, uh, you have a property in your IRA and you get a call at 3 o'clock in the morning, somebody's busted in the front door. Uh, you grab some lock sets off the shelf and you go over to, to secure the building. And uh, isn't that okay? No, it's not okay because you've, first of all, provided a service, and second of all, you've made a non-monetary contribution to your IRA. So you got to have uh, someone that you can call uh, to handle that. Now, as far as the management goes, if it's just uh, uh, interviewing a tenant 
and authorizing tenant, that's fine. But full management uh, capabilities uh, really should be handled by a management company, not uh, not your group. Yeah, thanks for that answer. Um, it really doesn't look like that we have uh, too many more questions. Um, I mean, Dykes, you know, we'd love to get some additional sure. input if you have any, you know, parting well, thoughts. Well, one thing, since like we that. had so many questions about uh, uh, properties in an IRA, I will tell you that uh, I have looked for years, because I've had a self-directed IRA since the late eight, uh, 1980s, and I have looked at, at this uh, issue for years about buying property in the IRA. And I find that properly structured, I could strip off as much money uh, with a with somebody else owning the property and my IRA just holding uh, notes, mortgages, and options on the property as I could have with the actual ownership of the property in the IRA, avoided a lot of the questions and avoided a lot of the potential conflicts that would come uh, with holding the property in the IRA. So uh, I would say, you know, think a little bit more creatively about uh, having somebody, for instance, uh, one property uh, uh, that I did, uh, I had someone buy it that uh, could do good management uh, on the property because he had his own management system set up, and I let him make uh, a, a fee that was a little bit in excess of what he would have made in just managing the property, yet he got all the depreciation on the property, everything. And my IRA got the profits uh, on the property both from the rentals and from the ultimate sale. Good point to make, absolutely. Uh, and, and, you know, like I said, you know, any other uh, parting thoughts on, you know, what we have is, is always welcome. Uh, just to, to kind of recap, uh, anyone that is uh, curious on getting a little bit more of this information, again, the uh, web address up there, Assets 101, is where uh, Dykes keeps all of his um, individual uh, education and different events that he does and promotes uh, separately from Advanta that, that he puts on. So do use that if you are interested in getting uh, more from him. It's also where you can register for his course as well. If you have any specific questions as there were, a few as to fees and different ways that uh, the actual mechanism of moving money and getting things set up works, uh, please feel free to use me as a uh, resource. Uh, you know, all my information's up there as well. So give me a call. You know, we don't charge for, for calls and consultations and things like that. So uh, please do ask that. Uh, Shelly asked, do you ever come to California? I know Pete wishes out there. Uh, Dykes, yeah, but I don't know. If I Pete and I that. just did the IRA class. We, we've been doing this class. And of course, we update it every year and, and add to it. But we've been doing it for 18 years. This will be the 18th year uh, that we've done it. And uh, we were just uh, in Atlanta last uh, March, and, or last February, rather, and then we were in San Francisco last July. So we do go to the West Coast from time to time, but it's usually every four to five years we'll do something in, in California. Uh, it, I shouldn't say something. Pete does class in California. I'm going to be out in California later this year, but as far as the IRA class goes, uh, we do that out there for four to five years. Great. Um, you know, with that said, um, I don't know what your uh, your time looks like. Uh, you know, we, we slated this uh, one for an hour, so 12.50. We have yeah. about another 10 minutes. Uh, you know, I will be on here, as, and, um, you know, Dykes, unless you have something you need to bounce off well, for. Well, uh, I just uh, ha ask everybody to look at the uh, advertisement for the IRA class. Uh, it's always great to teach with uh, Pete Fortunato. He brings a lot to the to the meeting. He talks about actual deals, and I'll talk about actual deals that we've done, and uh, show different ways that uh, a transaction can be put together. Plus, we'll look at all the rules that are involved and some of the loopholes that are uh, that are involved. And we hold this class at a hotel near the Atlanta airport, so we get a lot of people from uh, California and from other parts of the country flying in. Usually it's only about 30% of the people are from Georgia and the rest are from out of state. So we'd be glad to have you there. Absolutely. And uh, Keith, if you do have questions on uh, scheduling and pricing, that can all be found at uh, the assets101.com uh, website for Dykes. Okay. All right, Alex. I don't know that we've got uh, any more. We'll let everybody get back to their work day including me. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, Dyke, so we certainly do appreciate you uh, being on and partnering with us for this educational event. Uh, again, anyone, if you're interested in his courses, Assets 101, all my contact information is up there for uh, pricing and uh, different structural questions. Happy to do that for you. And uh, with that said, we'll let everyone get back to it. Uh, we'll finish up the recording and uh, get the information out to everyone as a follow-up. Thanks, Dykes. Okay. Sign up for the free newsletter at the site, too. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.